Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast, episode number 146 of the show. I am Ramon Mejia, I'm here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. And before we begin, I'm going to give a quick shout out to a, a new Patreon su- uh, supporter, John. That's who he said is on the Patreon, John. So thank you, John, for helping to keep the podcast free and ad free for everyone. Uh, of course, anyone else will help support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com uh, forward slash uh, Geek Bites Podcast. That's the name of the Patreon. Uh, you're supporting three podcasts there, the Geek Bites Podcast, the Literature Podcast, and of course, the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast. So you're you're helping three shows for the price of one. So there you go. Um, I see I have six new Lit RPG reviews for you folks at home this week. Uh, we also have a War Eternus for Harbinger of Ash. That one is going to be reviewed. Also, Hero, level up book number two in that series. Uh, also, Redemption, Rise of the Resurgence, book number three. We'll be getting a review. Wild Worlds, World One, Crash Course, a Lit RPG novel. Uh, on, after that, it'll be Realm Strider, a multiverse awaits. Then Sentence to Troll. And uh, there you go. And so before we get into it, we're going to Lit RPG News. And in Lit RPG News, we're beginning with the quick story about, well, me sort of. Um, I promise you guys <laughs> I'll be trying to get some Christmas holiday sweaters. And I did order them and I got them. Unfortunately, I failed to realize uh, that my Rick and Morty holiday sweater um, at the very top of it, the part you would probably be seeing mostly, is actually has like a green collar. And it's the exact same green as my green screen. Uh, so it's, I would look like I was headless wearing this thing on the podcast. So I apologize. I'll try to get something new and fun for next week. Uh, but there you go. That's just a personal note. Um, in other lit RPG news, though. We have a great deal on Shepherds and Moon, Singularity Point One, um, Point Zero One, I guess, um, on sale for the holidays for ninety nine cents. It's a fun sci fi little RPG. Um, it got a new series name. I guess there were a lot of other Omega verses that had come out recently, and the author decided to change that series name and the cover art uh, to like better reflect like the more space opera y kind of a vibe to it. Um, you might have already read it again as, as Omega verse, um, but if you haven't, go pick it up. It's also in Kindle Unlimited, ninety nine cents. So good deal. Um, in other little bitty news, we have a cover art reveal from uh, William. I'm sorry, Dave Wilmarth. He released the new cover art for Book Five of the Grayson Chronicles, and it's too cute not to share. I mean, this is one of the most adorable little bitty covers I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, you have Fibble with a bunch of dragons feeding one a cookie. It's super, super adorable. I mean, uh, the larger picture. Uh, Dave actually showed me the larger picture. We're gonna have for like the wraparound for the. Uh, for the physical copy, even nicer, a little more detail. Um, but this is super dope. I just couldn't, you know, wait to share it. And apparently, according to the author, um, book is an editing, hopefully it'll be done by the end of the year and I hope be published by then. So I'll have to wait and see. Um, in other little bit of news, we have James Hunter, little bit author and head of Shadow Valley Press, will be moderating an online panel uh, on the Fantasy Nation Facebook page. Um, it'll be uh, the panel on new authors, anonymous. Uh, so... These are folks who are new authors. Uh, I'm not. I mean, that's what I'm getting at. Um, the panelists are going to include Richard Hummel, author of Radioactive Evolution, um, Michael Haspo, author of Graveyard Shift, and Xander Boyce, author of Advent Red Mage. Uh, two of those are little bit authors. One is not. But again, that, that page is for um, fantasy, um, little bit and. Uh, well, I forget the last one. I think it's Cyberpunk or something. I remember. But, you know, it, it, it's a group that doesn't just do a little bit. It does a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, maybe it's Urban Fantasy because that's what James Hunter does too. But anyways, um, it's a panel with those three guys and, and James Hunter moderating. So uh, the description says they'll share their experiences as new authors in the publishing industry as well as some of the ups and downs and potential pitfalls of the business. Uh, it'll be on Friday, 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes for the um, Facebook page for the group, Fantasy Nation, and also the link to this particular um, article. So there you go. Okay, um, in other Liberty news, uh, I will be talking to Charles Dean uh, about his newest release, War Eternus 4, Harbinger of Ash, uh, for a live uh, YouTube author interview. 
Uh, if you're a fan of his work um, or the man himself, we just want to ask him embarrassing bacon and beard related questions. Um, you can join us on Sunday uh, at 1216 at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, that will be um, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or anything in between. Um, we'll have a link in the show notes. So you can click on it. It'll be the YouTube page that's set up for that live stream. You can hit a reminder button there to sort of remind you by email or whatever you have set up on YouTube um, when it actually starts. Uh, but it'll going to be Sunday, um, 12, 16 at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So there we go. Um, in our last bit of little RPG news, we have uh, news from Michael Scott Earl. And no, he's not back on Amazon yet. That's unfortunately not the case. But um, he, there has been some progress, apparently. He recently sent out some information to people on his newsletter list, newsletter, newsletter list um, asking for help with Amazon. According to the letter, which is much longer than I'm, I'm summarizing, um, he's fairly close to getting his, his account, uh, publishing account, reinstated. There's a whole long explanation about why, and we've covered some of the reasons, like the history of like this particular incident in the show before and other articles on the Loader BG podcast website. Um, but according to, uh, I guess, like, once he involved lawyers and they talked to Amazon lawyers, Amazon kind of final, finally revealed that uh, uh, readers were going through, and this is a quote from his newsletter, readers are going through MSC's books faster than humanly possible, so we think he was cheating our Kindle Unlimited system. Um, this to me, and now this is my opinion, obviously, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's BS. Uh, it's not. It's not something that's been limited to to Michael Scott. To be honest, like every single month for like half of this year, um, authors on KU have been getting letters saying that they've detected unusual page reads. Um, and before they were just like suspended, and if it happened again in a second month, their account was just like closed, uh, and it may or may not have been reinstated at some point. Um, more recently, um, authors have just been getting letters every month saying, oh, we're detecting an, you know, unusual Kindle Unlimited reads that we think are suspicious and we're just not going to pay you for them. And there's no evidence of any wrongdoing on anybody's part ever given. It's just Amazon algorithms or Amazon people saying, more like the algorithms, saying, oh, this this is suspicious. And Amazon is saying, we're just not going to pay you for this. We're not going to suspend you. We're not going to, um, you know, uh, close your account necessarily because they got backlash for that. Um, and instead they're just like not paying authors for the Kindle limited reads they think are suspicious, whether or not there's any evidence, um, or actual evidence saying that, Oh, an author is doing something or, or any kind of bot activity or any bad activity happening whatsoever. Um, even me, I was on off Kindle limit for a really long time just because of this kind of situation. And when I came back this month within like a, a week of being on Kindle limit, I got another letter saying, Hey, we suspect um, weird activity here. So we're just not going to pay you for anything we think is suspicious. And uh, it's a huge flaw in the algorithm for Amazon. They think voracious little RPG readers are bots. Uh, apparently. So there you go. Uh, now back to MSC, Michael Scott Earl and his request to fans and supporters. Now this is actually a quote from his, his letter for, it says, uh, Amazon has asked to talk again with my lawyers in early January. They've asked me to provide a list of places where I've marketed my books and a list of any botting services I use. What I'm going to show them is a list of Facebook ads I've run for the last year. It's the only average thing I do. And a huge stack of emails that you have all sent to Jeff Bezos at uh, at the address of uh, jeff at amazon.com. So can you help me out? This is where he's asking, requesting assistance from, from supporters. Uh, please email jeff at amazon.com and copy me on the email at uh, m uh, s at michaelscottearl.com so my lawyers can track them. Um, if my law lawyers come to the meeting with a three foot tall stack of printed emails for my 22,000 fans, Amazon's lawyers will have to reconsider the whole cheating angle. It would be obvious that I'm just a great writer with a bunch of hungry fans and not someone trying to game their broken system. So there you go, folks. If you uh, want to help the guy out, please do so. Um, well, again, information in the show notes about those email addresses. If you don't want to write them down or try to copy them from like the small video screen, um, He's being unfairly banned, and he's a liberty author, so we try to support our own. Uh, he also does a lot of other writing and other things, so, you know, there you go. Um, there you go. And that's the end of Loader News. On to stuff that is out now. One thing out now that I haven't read. Uh, December is generally a slower period of time for any writers to publish, so not a lot of stuff is, is coming out. Um, only one that I haven't already included in, in previous podcasts or I haven't read personally. And um, that's the great filter, a post-apocalyptic game lit novel um, from Russell uh, Wolowinski. So there you go. 
new audiobooks. There are more of those, uh, including Through the Belly of the Beast, Underworld Book Number Two is out as an audiobook now, as is Steam Whistle Alley, The Adventure in Augmented Reality came out as an audiobook. Uh, the System, Futuristic Dungeon Core Laboratory Book Number Eight, out as an audiobook. Uh, Path to Peace, Alpha Rule Book Number Six. Now, I mistakenly previously in another podcast thought it had come out already. It turned out it was just a pre-order <laughs> link order. So that's on me, but it's actually out now. I double checked. Um, so go check that out. Uh, and also Rhea, uh, Starter Zone, Archon's Chosen, book number one. Uh, that is also out as a lit RPG or so, a lit RPG audiobook. So all kinds of new things for your folks to go check out. Um, in the cu- upcoming lit RPG, this is just where I read a bunch of stuff that I know is coming out in the near future because of pre-orders or authors have told me. And that includes December the 14th. It'll be the Song Matron, a Liberty Journey, you know, World Online Trilogy book number three. So it looks like this is the last book in that particular um, series. Uh, on December the 16th, it'll be Free Haven Online Winter Dungeon Land book number three. And that'll be out. On December the 17th, it'll be True Hero. Champion is playing book number one. December the 17th as well. Realm of Noria. Uh, then it's going to be December the 19th for Dungeon Mauling, the third book in the Good Guys series. December the 27th, Finding a Body, Dark Oblis, book number four. January the 1st, Break, uh, Evo Born, book number one. January the 9th, it'll be Level Up, The Knockout, book number one. And then it's going to be on January the 29th, Never Fall, Catacombs, book number two in that particular series. Uh, so there you go. On to new releases and reviews. And in new releases and reviews, we're going to begin with the review for War Eternus, book number four, Harbinger of Ash, written by Charles Dean. It is 526 pages, $3.99. It is on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, Here's the author's description. Lee has managed to survive encounters with the heralds of three different gods, but the price he has had to pay has been tremendous. Every step you take leads him closer to victory in the cruel game that he has been forced to play, but it also takes him further down a dark path and away from the man he used to be. After receiving a request for aid from a beautiful and mysterious messenger, Lee and his inner circle travel to nearby Burnsfield, a large and prosperous city ruled by the Dragon King. Before he ever arrives, however, Lee encounters a group of marauders ransacking the countryside, meets a strange new herald who has set up camp in the region, and receives the dire news that the hero Bridget of Kildare has gone missing. To make things worse, a powerful new enemy is stalking him from the shadows, towing with his dreams and striking at his closest relationships. With the seeds of doubt sown, Lee is Lee has to choose whom he can trust before his nightmares become reality and everything he has worked so hard for goes up in flames. So there we go. That's honestly a really good description of what the novel is. This is uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, full disclosure, I received and I read an advanced copy of the story, purchased the novel when it came out, of course. Um, for me, this is definitely one of the best novels in the series. Um, I think I, one of, I think I like book one just because it was new. I like new shiny things. Um, but the character arc for the main character is really coming to a head in, in this particular novel. Um, the depths to which Lee sinks is both inspiring and terrifying. It's a little bit of exaggeration, but it's, it's, it kind of does reflect the path that the main character is, is going on. Um, it's, and it's generally fun to see for the course of these last three, four books. Um, how the main character is like gradually choosing a more and more morally ambiguous and almost evil path for me. It's it's like he's starting his journey towards the dark side. And this is the book where he's like crossing the line more and more. Um, and of course it's all done in the name of good. It's not like he's intentionally being evil or he's just like, you know, a bad person at any point. It's always doing things that are morally ambiguous or potentially considered socially unacceptable for the greater good. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting character arc to, to, to describe, especially considering where the characters start out in book one. Um, it's a very interesting character development. Now, other than that, there's all the same stuff that you enjoy. Um, this time is actually, I think, a better villain uh, in this novel than there have been others in the past. There's the same good action adventure. Um, there is town building. It's a minor amount, though, in this novel. It's on the back burner. Um, and there are, of course, all the characters that have come back, yeah, including some that you may or may not like. Uh, not everybody's a fan of Miller. Not everybody's a fan of Jade. Uh, Jade, to me, is, is a super fun, hilarious character, but I know some 
from some of the reviews that she's also kind of annoying to other people. So, but they're back uh, and the banter and the group stuff is all there. So if you liked it, you liked it. If you don't, you don't. Um, overall, this is a good action adventure story uh, that it's starting to lean towards the darks. And I think that keeps it very interesting um, because that's, if you're taking a realistic approach toward, toward like, how do you be a hero all the time when, you know, uh, and not hurt other people or not make the hard choices, um, I think that's a much more interesting story, I think, than just the hero who always does good and there were never any negative repercussions for for those choices, you know what I mean? Uh, and this this is, it, it's hitting that, that really interesting gray area that, that has some really great storytelling potential. So it works for me, it gets a 7.7 out of 10. That's War Eternus for Harbinger of Ash. There we go. Uh, and on to our next review, which is gonna be Hero Level Up, book number two, um, written by Dan Sugar. Uh, Sergolovino, Sergolanov, sorry man. Um, it's five hundred ninety pages, six dollars ninety nine cents. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. A lazy and wussy ex gamer, Phil becomes one of the few humans who can receive a mysterious alien piece of wetware, which allows them to see the world through an augmented reality interface very similar to those used in an MMORPG game. Guided by its stats and messages, Phil begins to level up gradually transforming himself and his life. He even opens his own business in order to help his friends and complete strangers who acquire a newfound respect for him, assisting him in his travels. As Phil continues on the road to self-improvement, guided by his own conscience rather than system messages, he tries to find out more about the mysterious third party which has bestowed such superhuman abilities upon him. So there we go. Okay, uh, this novel is absolutely the epitome of slice of life um you're basically following a guy as he gets uh gets his life together he in a modern setting he does things you think would be boring um like working out at the gym um spending time with his girlfriend starting a business uh and while those things on their own again <laughs> sound absolutely tedious uh in in novel form um because of the addition of rpg mechanics it really makes it so fascinating i'm, I'm hard pressed to <laughs> to describe exactly why maybe it's my infantile fantasy of like oh i wish i had rpg you know game powers too and it would make all those other things i do on a daily basis uh more entertaining i would see like real stat growth and like i would have special abilities related to them um maybe that's the case maybe that's what makes it so fascinating and interesting for me but i i do i i find this novel just utterly interesting uh in, in the way that the main character uses the rpg mechanics and rpg game interface to to make his life better um in the story, there are social game mechanics, uh, there are stat increases, there are special skills that get bonuses, item bonuses, um, and it really is just so interesting to see how the main character uses the that interface to plan out and improve his life and also those around him. Um, I also like the fact that there are negative consequences when he fails. Um, uh, for example, if he takes a, a quest and he fails it, he actually loses XP. He doesn't actually all, all, like he just positively gain every time. And also, if he has poorly thought out plans uh, or actions that have a negative social impact, you know there are also consequences for that. In according to the game interface, so I, I like those aspects as well. There's also like this sub plot story where the, about alien time travelers judging the main character, see if he can keep the interface. But that's a minor arc for most of the novel. Most of it, uh, the interesting parts for me at least, are just like his daily, everyday life and just following him along, which is again a slice of life. That's literally what slice of, slice of life is. Um, and in this case, it's just interesting to see how he's using these RPG mechanics. And again, it's, it's fascinating for me. I know not everybody likes slice of life, but this is just, it's so fun to me. Uh, and I get that it's not for everybody, but it's it's enjoyable. I like it. It's one of my favorite series at this point because again it's just I, again maybe it's just like that wish fulfillment thing for me is that i wish i had rpg mechanics in my life too and i would I, I don't know i'd work out more or maybe i just i would love the bonuses for cooking or podcasting i don't know uh but overall i found it an enticing read i read it all in one sitting um and for some reason i just i like this one more than one probably because a little bit because you just jump into the the story and you don't have to do any setup for it which which is what would a good chunk of the beginning of book one was um and so there you go for me it gets a score of uh 7.8 out of 10 i liked it quite a bit uh that's hero level of book number two the little bridge series uh with a score of 7.8 out of 10 so there we go Next review, Redemption, The Rise of Resurgence, book number three, written by Joshua W. Nelson. Um, it is 494 pages. It is $3.99. It is available on Canon Limited. Here's the author's description. Resurgence is hiding a secret. It's taken Alex months to find it, but 
find it, he has. There's only one problem. It might just be an unbeatable force that he can't defeat on his own. Luckily, Alex has never been without his group of friends ready to join him for any challenge. Fighting through requests that shouldn't exist, acquiring items that no one else has access to, Alex thinks there may be hope. However, it will take more than a few pieces of unique gear to conquer the lands of resurgence. So, what will say what you will about Alex? His teammates certainly do, but chance is usually on his side, even when he doesn't know it. While Alex pushes the boundaries inside of resurgence, a conjurer of special agents works on the outside to uncover any advantage to use against Alcon, the company behind the game. Alex will face new foes, use his unique abilities in ways he's never imagined, and maybe, just maybe, find a way to win. So there we go, folks. Uh, Photo Scourge, I received a man's copy for review. I purchased the novel when it became available. And actually, um, at the time of this podcast, it's not actually out. It'll be out tomorrow on Friday, December the 14th. Uh, but rather than like make this you know you wait a whole number, I put it into this podcast. Um, so it took me uh, honestly. <laughs> one of the things that's probably the hardest for me to do was to remember who everybody was. Uh, it's th- I think it's been like a year and a half since the little book two in this series came out. And so it's been a really long time uh, since I've uh, read these characters and read about this novel. So it took me like 15% of the story to really remember the details about whoever it was, their powers, their roles, the storylines. And so just, if it does for you, um, don't worry. You'll actually remember after a certain point. Um, Book three in the series has really solid writing. It's entertaining. Um, But for me, there weren't a lot of surprises. Um, The good things from the series are still there. Group banter, good MMO fights, and adventuring. There's a minor amount of advancement uh, of the evil corporations versus the government arc. Um, Mostly some reveals about background players, but it's not like it's a a huge part of the story anymore. The cyber thriller aspects in the novel don't really exist since they were kind of tied up um, in book two uh, for the most part. And now it's just like trying to catch the bad guys. you know, behind the scenes in the, in the game company, but it's a lot of setup, I believe for like the next book, um, uh, still. Um, and because of that, there feels like there's a little bit of a disconnect between like the game story adventures and the real life, um, story parts where you're like seeing the government and you're seeing things happen in the real world. Um, but that's just me. Um, but overall it's entertaining if you're a fan of the series, but again, it doesn't really do anything new it started to me at least coast on what worked with book two and like the straight action fantasies um action adventure and all that's really well written i'm just saying it's like oh i it, it in a lot of like thematic ways it feels you know n- n- like there's not anything really being new about the table it just that it does the good things that it did in book two again and there's different story plots i'm not saying any of the in-game stories are are like mimicking or like they're copying they're, they're all original stories they're very entertaining in their own in their ways but you know it is what it is. And again, entertaining story, just like for me, it gets score 7.1. I had a good time with it, but I think nothing is really that new. And again, it's just, it, it's a good story if you're a fan of the series. I don't know that this would be your fan favorite if this is the first one you're jumping into, though. So there you go. 7.1 out of 10 for me. Enjoyable. Uh, for Redemption, The Rise of Resurgence, book number three. Okay, uh, next review. It's going to be Wild World's World One Crash Course, a literary novel written by Mitch Larkins. It is 245 pages, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. Here's the author's description. Uriel is having a bad day. Ambushes by pirates, the legendary Valiant finds herself wrecked and alone on a hostile planet. Bairn is having a bad day. Lost on some strange backwater planet, his inexperienced adventurer finds himself at death's door, surrounded by strange beasts and monsters. Together, the two must join forces to survive on this unforgiving planet, which means Yoriel must take the inexperienced Baron under her wing and try to level up the fool before he gets the two of them killed. Can the two set aside their differences to overcome secrets of their past and new overwhelming enemies to conquer the wild worlds? There you go. That's the description. Um... Yeah, that's fairly accurate. Uh, this is a multi narrative novel that feels more sci fan than literally. This is my actual review at this point. Um, and that's kind of the the summary of that. I thought there's a one sentence uh, description of the novel. That's it. Um, this is technically a literary story since it has one of the two main characters, Bairn. Um, he does gain levels at some point, and having comet levels is a intricate part of this novel's universe. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of the extent to the RPG stuff of the novel. Um, there are other words used in the story, um, like uh, HP, stats, AR, stamina, mana, uh, but there's nothing ever shown to the reader. And that's kind of the, my biggest issue with the novel, uh, uh, calling itself Library G. It is technically 
uh, the level the level use is is the most consistently used in the people who describe themselves or powers or people who are valiance or whatever um, by their levels. Um, main characters like uh, Baron is level zero, um, and other like bad guys or whatever they're described by level to show the power difference between them. Um, and that's kind of the most common. Everything else is literally just like the characters may see them, but it is never shown to the reader in any way, shape or form. And that's probably, that's unfortunate. Um, and for me, it feels like, oh, either this is a sci-fan story that was modified to include MMO terms, or the author kind of wanted to write little BG, but didn't want to deal with any real RPG mechanics or tracking of stuff. And I feel like it leans towards more the second part than the first. Um, but again, I don't, I don't have any real information on that. Uh, this is just what it feels like. Um, as far as like game mechanics goes, the other thing that's probably described the best is probably the main character Baron's class as a gadgeteer, uh, which is really only explained so the reader understands why he can fix a ship and why bad people want him. Uh, the class would be better off being called a job because it would make more sense because the main character that character re- literally has no levels in that class, but he can still use special abilities and magically knows how to repair complicated ships he's never seen before. Um, so there you go. That That's kind of the extent of the RPG mechanics here. The story itself, um, I thought it was really predictable and there wasn't a lot of tension for me at least. The two main characters, Uriel and Baron, train for almost half the book and that training doesn't matter to the story not even to the plot line that was described in the novel description where baron has to gain levels because he doesn't ultimately earn them himself but he gets power leveled by uriel who is infinitely more powerful than anyone else in the entire story which is again how most of the problems in the story are solved it's by the overpowered uriel Uh, and there's never really tension because she is so powerful that there's no real risk of her ever losing and the story unfolds kind of let you think it was once pirates are even mentioned in the story and and their point of view comes in the story at all um everything just like oh like you can kind of guess where it goes and it goes exactly where you think it would um overall the story isn't badly written on a technical level i don't i didn't find a lot of mistakes anywhere um and the storytelling pacing was relatively good um action is 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 pretty decently described as well it's just that as literature bg it left a lot to be desired for me, at least. Um, there's a serious lack of detail to most of the RPG mechanics. And again, I felt like most of it was hidden away from the reader, which is kind of a big, like, oh, what's the point of having it there? Then if you're going to not show the reader. Um, and again, but up to like that 45% mark, a lot of that story just feels like filler and it was hard to push through, but I did. Um, and while the story does improve a little bit, it wasn't enough because of, again, one of the main characters feeling so overpowered that there wasn't any tension. There wasn't any risk for anybody to, to really lose. And so even though the bad guy describes being powerful, you're always in the back of your head. Oh, this good guy is so much more powerful that there's really no risk. Uh, and for me, that's kind of what made it boring. Um, and there are other reviews for this novel on Amazon that kind of reflect the same kind of thinking that they didn't even bother to get past like a certain point in the story. I pushed through. Uh, and again, it didn't prove slightly, but I'm like, Oh, it's still overall not really that entertained. So for me, this is a score of 5 out of 10. Wild Worlds, um, World 1, Crash Course, a little bit novel. Technically a little bit with a score of 5 out of 10. There we go. Okay, next review. Realm Strider, The Multiverse Awaits, Volume 1, by Scotty Fooch. It is 203 pages, $2.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. For one year... Scott Duelman has experienced a particular delusion. His life has operated like a video game. Yet despite the innumerable status windows and unlocked achievements visited upon him, he never gained anything tangible from his exploits. Each success was met with a disappointing lack of usable reward. It is said that video games rot the mind. Certain that he has lost his mind due to playing too many freemium games on certain websites, he is nearly at the breaking point. Little does he know that what came before was only the prologue. Things are about to get sexy. Collectible card game, cross world, lit RPG, waifu, adventure, harem, sexy. So there you go. Uh, sanity is overrated. All power to the blue mallet. Uh, collect the cards, conquer the multiverse, meet the girl, get all the girls, dial it back a little, realize you can't handle all the girls, and that's it. Only the girls, a bit <laughs> girl as nature is intended. A new story in the Project Scott multiverse unfolds. All the power to the blue mallets. Praise it. And that's part of the <laughs> novel description. Uh, Scotty Fuchs is, is a very fun character. Okay, uh, one thing I always have to give props to the, to the author, Scotty Fuchs, is that he is never afraid to take a risk uh, in writing a story that uses an unusual game mechanic. Um, there are uh, 
plenty of other novels that take huge risks in this way, uh, including stories that use real-time strategy mechanics um, and also turn-based mechanics. And I think he's one of the few authors who's even attempted to use turn-based mechanics, uh, and he's made them work to great effect. Like some of my favorite stories are, are, are the ones that use turn-based mechanics because they are so interesting. They are sort of, but it's still a little RPG and they still use RPG mechanics. Uh, so when I saw that this is incorporating card game mechanics, I'm like, I'm already on board to be honest. Uh, um, cause I'm, I'm a big mechanic nerd and I wanted to see how exactly how he was going to use that. And I was not disappointed. There's lots of good, interesting things he does here. Um, including like a, a variety of types of cards that have different uses in duels, but also the cards will have uses in his real everyday life. And I thought that was a really good, interesting aspect. There are like summoning cards that summon minions, um, or in this case, harem ladies, um, traps, resource cards, and, and just harem. It's just women who are surrounding him. There's no sex involved. It's not one of those stories. Although Scotty, which does have other stories that do have sex. This is not one of them. Um, there are lots of stuff on, and, and game mechanics that are pulled from other card games like Magic the Gathering, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Pokemon even. Um, and so there's a lot of cool things that are pulled. And there's also a lot of um, <laughs> Scotty Fuchs Universe um, cross promotion cameos. Like if you read other things on the, on the author's um, massive like list of things he's written you're gonna see you're gonna recognize cameos from a bunch of other stuff so that was also part of the fun um of, of seeing these uh the story unfold now here's where things drop a little bit um unfortunately after the 50 percent mark the card game mechanics mostly disappear and that's unfortunate uh the main character accepts a mission and the story shifts to an action zombie apocalypse story and i was just like as i kept reading i was like oh no the card mechanics are gone or like they, they mostly fade away they, they still exist and the main character uses them in the story but they they definitely are dialed down like a ton like in the first half of the story it's card mechanics card mechanics mechanics discovery new new things are unfolding all the time um there's a slice of life mechanic section in the middle that i thought was the best done uh, for me anyways in that the main character could use these things in his everyday life like he wants a hamburger he happened to have a special card he could pay the mana points for it and poof hamburger to eat uh or or we can change real life objects and use blank cards to make them into like cards you could use later as long, again, as long as he has the mana or he pays the other costs associated with it. Um, and so a lot of it was like resource management stuff and building resources. And it was very interesting. Although you could see like potential for it. It was also very limited because, again, the main character is only starting out. Um, and, and those beginning limitations were really limited kind of where the story was going potentially. Um, and so that shift where he, he accepts a quest card and he goes off on this adventure, um, was not unexpected. It was supposed to be a way for the story to get him more resources. It doesn't turn into that though. It kind of turns into this it reminds me a lot of some of the author's other stuff where he, he sends characters on independent missions or they're in zombie apocalypse. It fell along like those. Uh, and that may be obviously intentional. Uh, maybe it's like a reference to some of those other stories. Um, but it kind of loses a lot of the stuff I was really super enjoying in the story of the card mechanics being super important and used all the time in, in those missions. Um, so it, it does shift for people overall. I, I, I applaud the author for taking a risk in using a new kind of RPG game system. I really like the system. I was just saddened when it disappeared a little bit. Um, I'm already a Scotty food fan though. So I'm, I was entertained with the story, but I can tell like a lot of other people, won't be once that shift happens. Um, and I, I've read other reviews in the story where like, oh, this, it stops being what it's supposed to be or what it was before um, at a certain point. Um, and so for me, I'm giving a 7.1 out of 10 because I liked it. But again, this is another qualifier that I'm already a fan of the author. I've loved the stories and I got all the, co I got all the cameos and I got all the other reference that kind of bumped it up for me. And again, the action zombie apocalypse part isn't bad. It really isn't. It, it's just entertaining. There's plenty of action fun there's still rpg goodness in there um but again it, it is a shift away from that the part of the story that is really super enjoying which is the you know introduction and the the use of all those um card game mechanics so consistently so it is what it is for me 7.1 out of 10 for realm strider the multiverse awaits okay next review sentence to troll by sl roland 274 pages, $4.99 that is available on Kindle Limited. Here's the author's description. Punished 
for his toxic online behavior, Ch- Chad faces a 30-day sentence of full immersion therapy designed to improve his anger issues. For his endless trolling in real life, he's forced to play the most hated race in an Isle of Mythos so that he can finally experience what it's like to be on the other side. To make matters worse, their heroes tend to rid the world of evil aren't heroes at all. They're violent felons on their own twisted path to redemption. Now Chad must survive his one-month sentence in a world where anything goes. There we go. That's actually a really good uh, setup of the premise. Um, this is a trapped in game story where the main character is sentenced to 30 days as a troll in a fur full immersion of VR MMO for his toxic behavior online. It's a gag. It's a troll becoming a troll. It's on the cover. It's not a spoiler. The advanced, the action adventure side of things in the story are really well done. There's good pacing, good dungeon crawling. Uh, the fights are well thought out and described, and there are some nice character development moments for the main character. The only minor complaints I have on the story side of things would probably be like how rushed the last act of the story felt. It really did feel like uh, like a, there was a sprint to uh, conflict resolution. Uh, um, I would have loved to have seen, also loved to have seen uh, more of a struggle for those final resolution acts, but it, you know, it, the author has to getting to a certain point. Um, I would have also loved to have seen more of a striking cultural difference um, for the trolls. Um, there's, Definitely some nice backstory for the race, um, and you and you can they're 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 a hated race, and there's some backstory for it. But a lot of the cultural aspects of that particular tribe of, of, of forest trolls, you, they felt like they're human barbarians, um, just who look different in a lot of ways. Like there's nothing really culturally striking about them, and 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 maybe this is a bias that I have because of of, of I've read Life Reset. And that to me is probably one of the better um, monster main character stories where the main character is in a monster body and you get an opportunity to see what life would be like for an NPC monster or for like the monster races and how they're hunted and, and, and how their progression path is probably is different than like regular players potentially. Uh, and I think that that story kind of does a really good job of like differentiating that monsters evolve differently and monsters progress differently. And there are definitely um, game mechanics set aside for them specifically that makes them such a unique fun thing. And in here, in this particular story, not that doesn't really exist. The, the trolls are kind of just created as a um, as a kind of player class that nobody or player race that nobody's using at the point. And so, a lot of their cultural aspects and a lot of things that they do within their own society um, just feel like oh, like they're humans in a lot of ways. They're just they just look different, and they're they're judged by that appearance. Um, and, and I do like the fact, of course, that they. There's a game mechanic difference where they can't literally talk to the humans, and that that that's that's a good mechanic. But for the most part, I would have loved to have seen like a, a more striking difference culturally. Like they do a thing that no humans do, or they they progress and evolve differently than regular players. Something like that would have made that part aspect a little more uh, striking and interesting and and, and awesome. Um, but there you go. Uh, game mechanic side of things. Most of this is really good. It really is. Um, you get to see loads of information, loads of details about main character, uh, the, the race of the trolls, the classes that will be, be able to them, special abilities and the various skills he learns. Um, the class choices that the main character makes, they feel a little planned out. Like when, when I see a player is like, oh, I'm not going to spend my stat points every time I level because I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm like, hmm, that feels like you're planning for something in the future. Um and but there's still very good gamer logic and reasoning and progression in the story. Um, there are a few places in the story where things break down and they feel a little wand wavy. Um, story moments where it feels more like a fantasy story and less like an MMO or a RPG. For example, uh, when describing how the troll's ability, uh, the troll's ability to manipulate magic, it's described as imposing one's will or suggestions instead of any real hard coded RPG ability set with boundaries. Um, the same thing kind of occurs for cursed weapons and spells. Um, the one that threw me off the most though was probably when the main character talks to some NPC humans um, and he has a severe penalty to represent like this is a thing and not like this is a re- recurring um, concept that's made like a really big deal about through the entire show. Like he keeps leaving reputations with the humans because he keeps having to kill them. Um, and yet when he goes to talk to them, when he goes to interact with them, it doesn't matter a lick. And I'm like, Oh, that's, that's a waste that, that kind of feels like a conflict. Um, but again, those are all minor things. Again, the majority of the RPG Maddox and story really nice, really integral and they're consistent. These few things felt little off. So, um, overall though, it's a nice entertaining story. 
uh, making the main character a troll or, or basically a not human race uh, character adds some variety to character progression. Again, I would have loved to have seen that aspect pushed a little more, but again, still really good stuff. Gets a score of 7.3 out of 10 for me. Uh, that sentence to troll with a score of 7.3 out of 10. Enjoyed it. Okay, and that's it, folks. We are done. End of the show. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for listening, for watching. Um, you can find all the ways to, to hang out with us at Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon. Um, we'll link in the show notes for all those places you can follow us. And please do. Uh, that way you can see all the latest reviews, all the author interviews we do, all the, you know, all the latest news and, and, and uh, deals that I find on the internet for you folks at home. Um, and of course you can also hang out with us at littlebeatpodcast.com slash support. If you want to find out any ways to actually support the podcast and, and help keep us going. Um, thanks for hanging out with me, folks. Until we can hang out again, remember to go read some little RPG. Goodbye, everybody.